I hope you're all somewhere safe and cozy for this week's episode of Movie Magpies where we will be discussing scary stories to tell in the dark. I am your favourite axe murderer, Monique, here with the jingle man, Will. How about we just get right into it? That felt targeted. <laughs> <laughs> targeted? Yeah. I picked it because it, it's your favourite you lad You know I go jingling movie. on the weekends. <laughs> How dare you. <laughs> How dare you dox me in front of our audience. How, now they know that I go jingling on the weekends. Go jingle. The fuck are you doing? <laughs> so unprofessional, Monique. <laughs> so for those who don't know, what is Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? If people don't mind it being spoiled, hence you're here at the in-depth review. The Netflix summary of Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark is On the run from bullies, a group of trick-or-treating teenagers hide in a local haunted house and discover a trove of chilling tales unfolding within. Basically, a bunch of idiot teenagers don't think about the consequences of their actions yeah. and go snooping where they shouldn't. It really and does. It really, like, the summary really does avoid the fact that these kids were fucking asking for it. They chose this. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, before we get into it, obviously, there are some warnings for gore elements, character deaths, and arachnophobia. It is yes. obviously a horror movie with horror elements. It is a milder horror movie, more on the sort of Halloween vibes than actual scary horror vibes but do still be warned that there are a couple upsetting themes as with any horror and of course as you are now in the in-depth review ultimately spoilers for the rest of the movie we could spoil it at any point and we could also spoil other films at any point so watch the in-depth if you don't mind anything being spoiled with all that said let's get chatting about it so like we were talking about about the summary i think the kids are remarkably annoying in this film and they kind of go out of their way to be unlikable which i find yeah. a really interesting choice because it almost feels intentional in the film yeah well one of the comments that you made is you feel like the the two boys in this i don't know why i constantly say the two boys even though ramon yeah. is a character yeah. but like he's he's separate he we've already discussed why he doesn't count as one of the two boys yeah chuck and augie <clears throat> chuck and augie you yeah. said that they feel like the type of characters that go out of their way to be bullied yeah. which is such an apt description for like how annoying these teenagers are yeah these two boys specifically we'll get on to the others a, a little later but like augie and chuck kind of seem to go out of their way to be very annoying to the point where you understand like right from the start of the film that they're being bullied at school and all that stuff but they're these kinds of kids who kind of almost seem to look for it with the, their behavior and I don't mean that in saying like no kids deserve to be bullied I don't def I definitely don't mean it in that way but they're the kind of kids who who almost enjoy being the victims because it excuses their behavior and as yeah. a result in this film they come across as just annoying assholes they they don't have not social skills well they obviously don't have social they definitely skills lack social but they also skills, don't yeah. just they just don't have common courtesy yeah, like there no, are that's a couple a good times point. in this movie where they they hop into someone's car to hide and then immediately start rifling through shit they yeah. go to an old lady's house and it seems to be a blind old lady and immediately start rifling through yeah, her shit like just stop stuff. fiddling with it stop going digging at other people's stuff it gets you into so much trouble yeah, and to be kind of more specific with their characters, I think, like, Augie kind of comes across as one of these stereotypical, like, nice guys who's definitely nicer to girls with the... when he feels like he has an opportunity to get with them, and then when they indicate that they're not giving him anything, you know, or they're just being nice to him and they aren't actually, like, attracted to him or interested in him, he kind of becomes this standoffish asshole. Yeah, an interesting sort of yeah. example of this is Chuck has a sister, Ruth, in yes. the movie, and Augie's incredibly respectful to Ruth and very, oh, there are ladies present, don't say that whenever Ruth is around. Yeah. But their best friend is Stella and Stella hops out of this car at one point and it's just the two boys and Ramon who's our other sort of main character of our yeah. four and he immediately says something along the lines of oh yeah but she's Stella she's not 
dateable or something yeah, like that, like along the lines of uh, very much the vibes of, oh, but she's Stella. She's not pretty. Why would you want to like date her? She's just Stella. Yeah, well, he and says it- to Ramon, she's not your type in a, in a very kind of almost sinister and possessive kind of way, which is very... Yeah. Un- but also nerving. in the same way it's like she's not your type kind of like stay away from her yeah. but also in the way that he's implying that she's not anyone's type yeah which more likely that leads us to believe that she just wasn't his type oh wasn't his type or more specifically she wasn't interested in him yeah exactly which provides this essence of a history which arguably is very nice storytelling you know secondary storytelling which is really interesting but then on to chuck chuck kind of comes across as an annoying wannabe class clown yeah he's trying to be a funny prankster but he just is yeah irritating (laughs) he's very irritating and it's just like he always kind of comes across as performing even when there's no reason to be even if it's just like him and his sister Ruth and he's just almost performing as the prankster jokester kind of guy and it's just yeah he's just like oh the punchline is I'm a dickhead and that's not necessarily very funny all the time for sure I think you kind of know people like that in high school and you're just like uh yeah all right here we go yeah you you definitely had a couple characters in high school whose whole thing was that they had embraced being unlikable and then were just douchebags to everybody because no one liked them and you're like well nobody likes you because you're a douchebag (laughs) yeah exactly it's like oh he thinks he's funny and he's not not really he's got funny moments but ultimately you don't get used to him really but, mm. And even yeah. just moving on from the two boys in general yeah. to our whole main four cast, yeah. they're all very self-centered. Like, oh, yeah, there's absolutely. not a lot of thoughts they're for the consequences of their actions. Yeah, and there's no thoughts for how the consequences of their actions will affect not just them, but literally everybody else around them. Yeah, no, it, and I think we're leading on to Stella, our main character. Mm, at this Stella. Point, who... She's supposed to be our main protagonist for this film, but she is very strongly self-serving in that there's actually even a point that I realize or recognize that later on at the end, they come to a conclusion within the story and they have all the have all the answers and it becomes evidently clear that the answers that they had initially were enough to stop everything from happening but Stella chose not to pursue stopping this all immediately because you elaborate on that so we we get the insight well the we get the indication that Sarah Bellows is not necessarily just a straight out killer which also is a weird kind of twist that we'll talk about later on but we'll get to it but we get the idea that to stop the curse from happening and to stop the monsters from attacking each of them and then writing stories about them they need to return to the house and confront the ghost they have that information basically from the get-go because chuck witnessed the jump back in time and if he had taught he tells them later on once Tommy disappears and Stella once Oh yeah, no, it is once Tommy yeah. disappears, you're correct. Stella chooses not to pursue this line of inquiry because Ramon is the suspect number one of Tommy's disappearance. Because he's suspicious as fuck, but we'll get onto that in a second. Yeah, it's super interesting to me that Stella is incredibly self serving, not yeah. just in the fact that she specifically reads the book and summons yeah. Sarah and goes out of her way to find it as when well. asked not to by her friends like her yeah. friends are like no don't fuck that book that book is yeah. spooky what's, and she's like <laughs> what's kind of worse <laughs> is that Chuck comes down when they're in the basement and they find the book and she hasn't read it yet but Chuck comes down he basically begs her not to to read the book and begs her to just for all of them to just get out of there and she ignores mm-hmm. him and which, she just turns around and goes hmm too bad so sad yeah well she like when she reads the book for the first time which starts the curse everyone else is trying to open the door and get out while she you're all distracted yeah she she's used it as it an opportunity anyway. to just read the book because she's serving her own wants as opposed to the group wants or just general normal behavior really because i think if you're locked down in a basement i don't think you're gonna be like time to have a cheeky read of someone's private things oh gosh yeah and understandably then not only does she 
start the whole mess for everyone and is the catalyst for everything that is about to happen to her yeah. friends. She also then, when her friends go, we need to go to the police, we need to tell them that, you know, we think we know what's happening and give them the book. Like, once they see that the book is writing its own stories, they'll, like, help us out. She's like, no. No, no, because Ramon is suspect number one of the Tommy disappearance investigation, and I don't want him to be in prison because then he'll be in danger. Let's go put everyone else in danger this way. Oh, gosh, I know. And the interesting part about that as well is that the movie tries to show us that he's under suspicion for no reason, unfairly well, no, not, almost. Not, not, not for no reason. I think what's worse is that the film tries to go out of its way to depict Ramon being under suspicion from the sheriff for a racial reason. Except he was seen having an altercation with the boy yeah. that went missing and reneging on the fact that he said that he was just passing through and would be gone the next day, then the boy that he had an altercation with Disappears. goes missing. Yeah. Like, he's very much suspect number one for yeah, legitimate absolutely. reasons. But the movie tries to sort of shift that to be like, oh, yeah, and we'll move new. On. And I think we can move on to Ramon in that Ramon, throughout the film, if you watch it through the lens of the film itself, Ramon comes off as the love interest number one, ultimately. You know, a stereotypical love interest who the main character is into. But if you looked at Ramon on paper, he comes off, some comes across as super dodgy. He's a guy from he's super a guy creepy. Yeah, he's a guy who comes in from out of town very suspiciously. He's clearly older than Stella because he has his own car and later we find out that he's a draft dodger, so he's at least eighteen. And He's also very... From the get-go, we get this indication that if it was just Stella, he'd probably be okay with helping her out, but because... Because the, she comes with the two annoying boys, he's less inclined to, uh... To help. Fix things. Yeah. Mm. And it's like an early scene that we see in the drive-in where they all climb in and first Stella's the first one to climb in and he's like, Oh, hello, a lady. And then the boys come in and he's like, Oi, get the fuck out, all of you. And it's like, he, he has this such a quick turn that if he had actually turned out to be a serial killer, I wouldn't have been surprised. No, yeah, they definitely write him as a bit off from the get-go. Yeah, he and then comes across half, as very iffy. Mm-hmm, and it's, that's what we're bringing back around to the fact that all of our four main characters are, for the most part, unlikable yeah. or dodgy and in then, certain ways. Yeah, and then by extension, which I find it has this very strong Stephen King effect where, as a result, the bully has to be a psychopath because they have to seem worse by comparison to the main kids. And Stephen King is very prolific at doing this in his stories like It and various other works of his where the bully is basically one emotional break from killing someone. Yeah. And it's to to ensure that the main characters don't come across as... So that you don't see them as absolute assholes that they are. Because, comparatively, they're alright. But Tommy is a psychopath, basically. Yeah, he starts off as your run-of-the-mill jock who is a bully and is out to seek yeah. recompense for them. But they have to escalate with him, yeah. And stuff on the car. But then, like, the second that Ruth, who's Chuck's sister, goes, hey, stop it, that's, like, my brother and his friends in there, like, just let them out, he immediately turns incredibly creepy and unnerving because you have to escalate him. He has to be worse than yeah, just an Yeah, he has to be asshole. worse than, than the main characters at the very least. But mm -hmm. as a result, what, it, what I find interesting and not very Stephen King is that because the kids are genuinely such self-serving kind of assholes, he has to be a psycho. As a result, he has to be a, just a clearly mentally unwell, basically would have killed the kids if he, if he could and tried to because he had no intention of getting them out of the basement. He'd locked them in and no one knows that they're in there, so he was probably gonna kill them. Or let leave them leave to die. Them there, yeah. yeah. So it's it's this point of escalation where they didn't necessarily see an end to it. So as a result, Tommy comes across as just a serial killer. Like like serial killer mindset. Yeah. For almost no reason. Super like upsetting vibes. Yeah. Which is very, very interesting because almost 
the next scene after they all get let out is him getting chased by the scarecrow Harold. Yeah, well, and I, he's like to to be like just a a critical guy. I feel that it's very much a point of well, we can't keep him alive now because. To this point of escalation, what do we do now? If Tommy is still in the story, he has to kill one of the kids, basically. So we have to have him disappear from yeah, the story. Yeah, exactly. But in that moment, it's it's really interesting, his characterization, because yeah. he's been shown to be a little serial killery. Yeah, a little in crazy. Fact, quite a bit crazy. But then the second that he's like in trouble, he's calling out for his mum and yeah. getting really, really upset and scared. Yeah. And it's something that I find interesting that, and possibly intentional in this film, sure. is that you don't really feel for any of the characters when they're no. getting attacked or harrowed by these events. You're just like, mm. yeah, but you're kind of an asshole, though. You brought this upon yourself. Yeah, like, well, it was actually the point Tommy I was going to say is that his him calling for his mum almost feels like a moment of vulnerability that is not deserved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and it's it's a criticism that I had for Chuck as well in that when Chuck disappears because. The film tries to kind of go to great lengths to be like, oh, they disappeared, they're not dead, they're dead. But when he disappears, he, like, leading up to it, we get these moments of vulnerability where he talks about a dream he has where there's this pale lady following him through a corridor in the red room. And it's like, Chuck's been nothing but an annoying asshole up until these points. And then he's just got these moments of, absolute vulnerability or which almost cross into cowardice which don't feel deserved for the character because the character has been nothing but an annoying prick who really need like in a stereotypical story and it's what's so great about horror stories is that you don't really need a typical arc for a character and for sure Chuck definitely doesn't have one of those arcs but it brought up this criticism that I kind of have is that any moment of vulnerability that this film presents us with always feels undeserved and it it doesn't help us connect more with the characters it almost makes us feel more detached with the characters because they're having these moments of vulnerability another example being Stella calling her dad and and I don't know ultimately it almost seems like she's just she goes out of her way to distress her father yeah like calling him and not asking him to come pick her up yeah but being like if I disappear I didn't leave you I promise and it's like girl just say I'm at the police station but I can't leave even if you bail me out because I have to help a friend. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And why are you being so cryptic and upsetting yeah, and, and harking back to the fact that your mum left and you it's think a, it's your fault? Like, yeah, calm down. it's a really annoying part that makes it feel like she's just going out of her way to hurt her dad, who is played by Hank from Breaking Bad, and he's he's genuinely, let's be honest, he has like three scenes in this movie and he's lovely i think he's a lovely character in this because he's a lovely dad and i love stories that have dads like this in them because you just you can't help but feel for them he's just working long shifts because yeah. his wife left and, he's and he trying wants to, to take care of his daughter. daughter and he's a good oh. man and he's you know and just very likable but it doesn't matter because it's not important he's in it for three scenes and i'm talking about undeserved moments of vulnerability but it the film is kind of rife with that kind of storytelling where it needs to get points done quickly because it may have skipped over them and i wanted to jump quickly to another section of critique that i had where there are points in the story where characters are thrown to locations or areas for plot purposes but they don't really make full sense so the most egregious version of this is when tommy's mum is angry at him and she tells him to go get the eggs for some neighbor and do it tonight and do all that he goes and gets the eggs and then because his story is the scarecrow one harold the scarecrow he then ends up in the cornfield which is actually a quite a distance out from the the barn or at least where harold is in the cornfield yeah. is quite a distance so he actually goes out quite a distance just to be in the cornfield for no reason other than because the plot demands it and it's yeah, just, and it's like, why are you fucking around in the cornfield? Like, yeah. it's not even, like, said that it's a shortcut. Like, it's not even, like, his mum doesn't even have a thrower line, like, yeah. I mean, just go through the cornfield so you can drop them off at their porch, or, yeah. you know, something. Nothing like that. He just, oh, now I'm here, and I'm getting attacked by a scarecrow. Yeah, and it almost feels like, and uh, this is another coin, another term I'm going to start coining, is that we have a term known as plot armour, 
in which main characters will miraculously get away with things that would usually normally kill someone in real life or regularly in the story as the rules have led up to. Yeah, I'm coining, yeah, I am coining a new term which is a plot dagger in the ribs, which <laughs> is basically the plot goes out of its way to put a character in a situation where they are determined to die. And this film does that a lot, which I find dubious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and best. I think the most interesting part of this one, for me, like, yes, this one was annoying when we were talking about it as it happened, but with Chuck... He is almost lampshaded into being afraid of the Red Room so that he doesn't yeah. go into the hospital file room, which is called the Red Room. Yeah, but then, and then like, he, he runs lost. a great deal of distance to get as far away from his friends it's as like, possible. It's like, try not to get caught, so he fucks off in the other direction, ends up on the roof, gets locked up there, and when he sees some orderlies, instead of just being like, hey, going I don't know how I got up help, here, yeah. yeah, I'm super lost, he runs away from them too which yeah. to me was really stand out considering that chuck was the one that originally wanted to go to the police and to the adults yeah and then he turns it, and runs away it from basically adults. goes against his character for him to run away yeah so yeah. for me that was the most annoying one yeah and also of course so that he's separated from the group and he can get red roomed yeah with the pretty pale much. lady I but think, yeah another one i think in every single point other than ruth's story it has an instance of this mm -hmm. one one of them being very specifically with Augie Stella lives quite nearby and instead of going to help him they read the story out to him as he's as he's not well as he's not listening and participating in it and it would have been so much better and so much easier for them if they wanted to survive this to go and run to his house while reading to reading the story to him or warning him because they have a walkie-talkie and a walkie-talkie works on radio waves which can be more easily reached outside which is yeah, something it's also it's yeah. not like they were attached to a land cable and no, were exactly. trying to call them that way it's very specifically a walkie-talkie which they then take no actually do they take it with them or do they yeah, leave it they carry like, it around Every so often. Yeah, but, like, you know, they're about to go to Augie's house, and Augie has evidently, at this point, also been stupid. I can't remember. In where the last thing that he gets told on the radio before he drops it in fear is, get out of the house. So what does he do? He runs upstairs. He runs upstairs, yeah. Yeah, it's so. just... He, he kind of, it's the plot stabbing in the ribs but he kind of goes out of his way to go upstairs and then hide under his bed, the least safe place in his room because he's he's got a very clean room and a, like an uncharacteristically clean room for, room for a teenage boy. Mm. And yeah, it's 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 one of the things that kind of detracts from the good stuff of this film is that it has plot conveniences that are really convenient to the spooks, which spooks. not necessarily is it's not necessarily a bad thing, but ultimately feels a bit contrived mm -hmm. and honestly like i said sometimes this works in the story's favor where yeah, because sure. the characters are making such uncharacteristically idiotic decisions like they're in a horror movie they were always going to make poor decisions we knew that was happening yeah. from the get-go but because they're so like blatantly annoyingly poor decisions yeah when the actual horror is happening it is much easier to be impressed or spooked by the horror or harrowing that is happening to the character the event yeah. and the big bad of that specific scene than getting caught up worrying about what's going to happen to the character because oh, he was an asshole and he was being stupid anyway yeah look at that character design like that's kind of yeah and i think that is definitely a really nice turn twist on that critique is that it leads to the points that are the best bits in the film, and I'm glad we've gotten up to it because it's it's what we both probably really want to talk about, is hey, that yeah, the is. moments of the monsters attacking are probably the best bits in the film because they have incredible build-up, the monster design is awesome, and the music all works perfectly well to build this sense of tension. A sad minor drawback to that is, of course, that the jump scares that are dotted throughout the film break up these beautiful moments of tension mm. and as a poor result end up 
sometimes ruining the effort that has been put in to build a tense scene. But now to talk a little more in depth about it, we should start with just the general events. So with Harold the Scarecrow, he's a slow moving scarecrow. He was very easy to ultimately get away from, but he's perfectly aligned with Tommy because Tommy's not a character who runs away. He's a character who tries to confront. Yeah, ultimately, if we can be completely honest, if Harold the Scarecrow was just a man in a mask, Tommy would be like, yes, I finally get to kill someone for a good reason. Yeah. So. In fact, idiotic. He goes for the part of the Scarecrow. Yeah, he goes for the part of the Scarecrow. He immediately tries to stab the Scarecrow in the stomach. Like, his gut reaction is, I'm gonna fuck you up, not I'm gonna run away. Yeah, but it's absolutely great because basically it's a very short scene of tension with the Scarecrow being there. And I think the moments of unease and tension actually don't come from the presence of the Scarecrow itself. I think it comes from the moments after where the Scarecrow takes the pitchfork out of its body and then stabs Tommy with it. Because, and this is the bit that I wasn't allowed to talk about in the review, but the use of camera and framing techniques in this bit is so good because it builds this sense of unease and as we talked about in the review the film kind of goes out of its way to stop a lot of what we see from being too disorienting unless it works to its benefit and I think in this scene it really works to its benefit where we get scenes of extreme close-ups on Tommy's face as it fill as his mouth fills with straw and he's running to try and get back to his house and then also focus is drawn so tight so there is such a small depth of field that we can see his eyes like bugging out of his head as he's running and the straw like eking out of his mouth yeah and it's incredible it's incredibly nicely done they truly know how to capture the specific unnerving quality of a scene so they don't treat every single harrowing the same in fact not a lot of the stories are even similar in their like beats of each way that the character is taken Mm. and it's really nice it gives it a really nice variety yeah it helps keep the story feel fresh without having to move the plot along too too quickly which for the runtime of this movie it yes. didn't feel that long. Like, it's... No, yeah, it's it's 108 minutes long, and it definitely doesn't feel that long. It actually feels like a quite, sn- s- like, quite enclosed, well-put-together kind of film. It yeah, is like quick, a quite it works well. satisfyingly condensed movie. Yeah, that's a really good word for it. It works really well in the favour because of the way that the pacing is and the fact that each story is different. They allow each monster time enough to be shown or yeah. in this case for Tommy to be turning into the scarecrow everything gets its moment because yeah. the wrong the, because the runtime is yeah exactly yeah. the runtime is longer so that the pacing can really stretch its legs and yeah sit well and everything is given its own little moment which i really really love it's yeah. really interesting it keeps us very intrigued and especially for the younger audience that it is more directed at it keeps attention because not everything is just the same sort of tense stressful moments they're all different yeah tense absolutely moments. And I think for the scene with Augie, the Augie toeless zombie scene, I think what it does really well is that we actually are given so much time without the monster. And we're we're given, with Tommy's scene, it's basically he fights back, he fails, and then he's left to deal with the consequences, which is something that his character doesn't deal with often because he's the, the town bully and all that jazz. But... With Augie, he's given so much time to prepare, and then all of his preparation leads to nothing. All of his preparation in Kate even yeah. seals his doom. Yeah, and in in that sense, it's a different form of visceral th- fear that you feel, in that if you were given ten minutes to hide from a serial killer in your house, would you feel like you were given enough time, and would you feel prepared enough? And it's a really nice change from the previous Mm. one and then ultimately it leads to nothing it doesn't work out for him he ends up disappearing and dying probably and (laughs) leads to this sense of hopelessness that you could be as prepared as possible and then you'd get still get gotten and then you'll get got 
yeah, you still get got. And then Ruth's scene is really interesting because we actually don't see a whole lot of her dealing with her monster because she doesn't really have a monster. It's a bunch of spiders coming out of her pimple. But what I find interesting about it is it's this sense of running out of time for the main characters because ultimately Ruth is not one of our main characters. She's a side character who basically is just a victim of the book. Yeah, exactly. But we follow the main characters trying to find her and there it is a completely new sense of dread where it's this fear that they have an opportunity to stop someone from being taken or killed and they're running out of time, critically mm -hmm. running out of time. And it's great. It's really nicely done. And I will say, with Ruth's scene specifically, I have horrendous arachnophobia, so mm. I didn't actually watch it up I to did. a certain point. It's very yes. good. The second, the first little leg popped out of the pimp. That was enough for me. I was done. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely but, one of the most visceral scenes. Yes, it's uncomfy even listening <laughs> to you talk about it. Yeah. But basically, I really liked the way this happened because Ruth has a genuine reason to isolate herself which is she has a giant pimple and she's about to go on stage so she's yeah. left to try and fix it yeah the only thing that bugs me about it is that she doesn't end up being on the first floor bathroom she ends up being on the second yeah, floor bathroom she kind of which is just there to stretch time yeah she yeah. makes a bit of distance to get away which is a bit odd but yeah and with with all that said it's a really nice scene because then we're also given a sense that there is a little bit of hope because you can prevent the the, the negative from happening you can def prevent the disappearance yeah. although intriguingly i never want this question answered but it is a question i'm going to ask sure what would have happened if they didn't get there in time because as we were sort of discussing there aren't a lot of poisonous spiders in america these just seemed like run-of-the-mill stock standard huntsman spiders or, yeah whatever american spiders are big rig spiders yeah i don't know but yeah i'm getting I think itchy my my thought is that based on what we saw her bits of her face were starting to like fall away so i think she would have faded away into nothingness as more and more spiders came out of her maybe oh. i think there may even be a story about this i haven't read the book don't get at me. I've re I read a lot of books. I haven't read this one. I want to, but I I'll get around to it eventually. But yeah, that's what I think. I think she would have just slowly faded and faded and disappeared with yeah, the like spiders that come out of her face. Okay. All right. I would like to stop talking about this now. How about we? <laughs> so then we'll move on to the next one, which is the pale lady, which mm. I found, uh, which is one of my favorite fucking monsters. It's so fucking good. It's genuinely a genuine sense of fear in that Chuck just couldn't physically escape like there was yeah. no way he was getting away it's definitely this one is a feeling of entrapment no matter because he's stuck in the hospital and what happens is that the whole hospital is turned into a giant red room because yeah. these alarms go off and all of these red lights start flashing everywhere and mm. it doesn't matter which corridor he runs down the pale There's lady pale is lady always the yeah. gaining on him and it doesn't matter like he can't reset her he can't like flip through a doorway and change yeah. his corridor and therefore change her distance she is always the same distance away from him so unless the kids got to him in time and even if the kids got to him in time there was probably no way to save him yeah. because he was genuinely being caged in yeah, basically. And with the last one present, the Jingle Man, he that's more just a sense of escape where the two of them actually can get away from it and it's more about running away from it than taking it on head on. But Yeah, the tenseness of the Jingle Man comes from the fact that he is so unnerving. Like he genuinely yeah drops his head down a chimney yeah he's and beautifully pieces scary. himself together but wrong like yeah. he's he's less scary and more upsetting yeah. i suppose would be the way that i put it his gimmick is that he is unnatural he is literally trained to one specific target and he is quick like that's yeah. his thing it's not that they can't outmaneuver him it's that he's just so bloody quick yeah but with all this said we've been talking about how to escape or how the film tackles taking on of each of the monsters which i did for an intended purpose because it leads on to our pointless research for this week ah uh, yes and this week's research because ultimately it's our Halloween episode. It's one of our Halloween episodes, so I wanted to make it a little bit of fun. So this week I will be researching you, Monique. <laughs> and my Glad. research 
project is now about would you survive a horror movie? Probably so, not. Let's get ultimately, into it. the aim of this game is I'm going to give you scenarios, and I'm also going to give you multiple choice answers on how to escape them or avoid them. Not necessarily uh, either one, but delay them. <laughs> delay? Not, no, not even delay them. Just to get away from them or not encounter them even altogether. Even encounter them. Cool. So there will be the main questions, bonus points if you can recognize the film that they actually come from. Oh. <laughs> I was hoping this would just be a multiple choice and I wouldn't have to think about the it. The bonus <laughs> points do not necessarily count to the overall score. If you score zero bonus points, then it doesn't necessarily detriment you in any way. But, but I want nice my badly drawn trophy. You, you, well, if you get all the questions right, or if you win, you get all the questions right. However, because this is a Halloween episode, there is also a price if you get no questions correct. A price? Yes, and that price is, I will send a monster to hunt you down. Okay. <laughs> with, that, with that monster being me. Yeah, I, you're going to come hunt me down? You're going to come see me in person? This isn't a bad issue. Maybe I should just throw the whole game. Well, no, but I'm going to come and visit you and then murder you. <laughs> Halloween. Okay, let's get into it. <laughs> so, starting with our first question. You ready? You feeling mm -hmm. psyched? Also, sure. audience at home, you can play along with this too. If you get all the questions right, then good for you. You get a badly drawn, drawn trophy. If you don't, don't tell me, because I can't get to everyone's house all at once. <laughs> all right, so question one. You're at a summer camp. You're a summer camp counselor. Oh, God. And you notice the other counselors are going missing all night. What do you do? A, you suspect they're just ha being horny teens, and you go about your business. You got plenty of work to do. B, you call the cops immediately and gather who you can together as early as you can. C, fuck them. Your car still works, so it's time to get out of the camp. What are you going with? A, B, or C? Well, this is Friday the 13th. Okay, you get one Jason bonus Wolfies. point. And, well, this is my question. Is this, like, abandoned camp? Like, is this late Jason Voorhees movie, or is this early Jason Voorhees movie? I mean, timeline, sorry. So what I'm saying is you're a camp counsellor, so you're setting yeah. up for camp at Camp Crystal Lake, now that you've guessed it. You're setting up for a camp, so you have other counsellors with you that you know of, but some of them are going missing tonight. In the night time, like, going missing. Yeah. I would just get the fuck out of Dodge, to be honest, if we're in the middle of the woods. So you're going no. C? Sure. Alright, so C. As a result, you end up isolating yourself from the others in the camp. You would probably be killed by Jason. Ugh, unfortunate. Incorrect. Moving on. <laughs> so to question two. You're hiking with your friends in the Scandinavian wilderness. One of your buddies takes a tumble and twists their ankle. It's a great many kilometers and a few more days travel back to your hotel. Your friend, who hikes more regularly than you, says that you could take a shortcut through the main forest and halve the travel time. Do you A. Take the shortcut. Your friend is hurt, so longer travel times could have a detrimental effect on all of you. B. Avoid the shortcut and take a longer route. Traversing familiar ground would be safer, even with the distance. Or C. Call the state's rangers. They'd be able to get a truck here in a few hours. Do we have service? It's a good question. No, you don't. No one's ever asked that before. <laughs> I know, this is the movie that we watched at our friend's house that I don't remember the name of, but it ends up very culty with like a sure. giant lad. <laughs> sure, but if you only if you get the name, you get the bonus point. That's unfortunate because you know I'm horrible with names. I would go the familiar rate. Route. Right. Yes. So B, you. you are correct. Yep. You have Heck survived yeah. the ritual. The ritual. That's such a simple name. How did I forget <laughs> that? All right. So. Third one. It's your kid's birthday party, and the clown has cancelled last minute. You've gotten the deposit back, at the very least, but your son is really looking forward to seeing Bozo the Clown be at his party. Do you A. Disappoint your son B. Do your best to be a clown at your son's party using a costume you found within the house Or C. Use the deposit to double up on presents and food for the party. You may not be able to get a clown, but you at the very least can try. Clown. The movie is The Clown. You get a it's bonus point. It's an incredibly point. upsetting movie, and I'm Poor very upset that you've mentioned it. And uh, I would go with C and try and get like some extra presents and things. So right. there's a compensation. You have survived The Clown. Heck yeah, Nicely I have. Nicely done. That's probably a good choice. All right, next question. You're visiting Sweden, and your Swedish friend says there's a place out in the country which has a really fun and exciting community that you'd love to check out. Do you A, 
Go out there and experience the cultural delights that Sweden has to offer. B. Go for a day visit. Ultimately, nothing in Sweden is too far from the main city, so it should be it would be a waste of time not to at least check it out. Or C. Choose to stay within the main city, Stockholm, and enjoy the foods and sights of the city that is famous for its open air museum, which I had to look up. <laughs> is I this needed... Midsummer? Midsummer, correct. Midsummer. C. I would stay away from an open-minded anything. Open that sounds culty. People? Oh, all right. Fair enough. You survived Midsommar. All right, next question. You move into a new home, which is really just a, just one big house that's been turned into a series of flats. But your house seems to have a small door that during the day leads to a brick wall, but at night leads to an alternative reality where everything is wondrous and your other world parents are exciting and will give you anything you want. Do you? A go into the world with the intention of returning home once you are bored of it, as you're aware that the there is surely something sinister going on. B. Go through the door and enjoy the life of the other world. It is surely better than the boring world that you came from. Or C. Ignore the door. Whatever is beyond it can only be a whole lot of fucking trouble. Yeah, ignore the door. Keep that shit locked. Ignore the door? Yep, that's Coraline. Sorry. <laughs> Coraline? Alright, that is Coraline. However, I don't know why I, like, rushed to say that. However, ignoring the door would not actually prevent the other mother from getting to you, as situated from the book, which I have finished reading recently. Oh, I haven't read the book. The That's other unfair. mother would be able to get to you anyway, and with your unawareness of the world, you would end up being subject to its whims. Fair enough. I All right. And alive. final question. You live in a town where some annoying arsehole regularly parades around town and profits that Halloween is a dangerous time and you should not be enjoying it. He rides a bike through town every day with a flask that seems to be the sort of thing that is a multi-purpose or situation device and many residents do not like him. How would you treat him? A. The same as everyone in town. He seems like the kind of guy who goes out of his way to play the victim and the fact that he wandered into a school covered in a bedsheet stained with his own urine is the kind of thing that warrants concern. B. Ignore him. He seems like a lot of trouble that you just don't want to be a part of. C. Treat him like he's the greatest, kindest, and sweetest guy in the world, despite his actual behavior, because you know you're living in a world written by Adam Sandler. <laughs> is this trick or treat? Trick or treat? Oh, no, sorry, um... How dare you, that what movie called, is we watched it. We fucking, I watched this literally last Halloween, and I'm, I'm bad you at minus names. a thousand points for... No, you're not allowed to minus a thousand points from me, that's rude. Whose quiz is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's our quiz now. <laughs> our quiz, oh, uh, because you don't want to lose points. No, alright. No, it's not trick or treat. Well... No bonus point for me then. No. The third one, because third one. it's an Adam Sandler movie. Because it is an Adam Sandler movie. Alright, so you ended up surviving Hubie Halloween. One of the worst Hubie! films ever made. Oh. Yeah, so at the end of that, you scored a total of four out of six. With four That's not bad. With four bonus points, so you at least you're very consistent. Heck yeah. However, with that being said, secretly the bonus points were worth nothing. A cheeky Obviously. little... A cheeky little Halloween ruse for you. I got tricked. <laughs> <laughs> I got tricked. <laughs> I think you'll find Did you out. move away from the mic? Yeah, of course I did. But anyway, with that all said, I hope you enjoyed my annual Halloween quiz of survival. Do I... Did I win? Did I die? You did what win. was the threshold? You got a I did win. Okay. You got a majority of points, so I'm gonna say you definitely lived. On a scale, since you got four out of six, you'd be one of those teens who you think is gonna get away, but then doesn't. But in the real world, you did survive. Heck yeah. Because I think that's enough to warrant a win. Nice. Majority rules. Yeah, you don't we get love. a trophy though. No, I'm only joking. I'll, I'll, I'll draw you a fucking trophy. <laughs> I'm so mad about it. So, it's such a wibbly wobbly way of presenting my personality. But yeah, so hopefully you in the audience participated along as well. If you enjoyed it, please let me know. I actually genuinely love doing these little quizzes. They're really stupid and a lot of fun. I surprisingly like them as well, despite the fact <laughs> that I am always put on the spot. <laughs> That's all good. Well, I tried to make it a little funnier this time. But yeah, this one was nice. The yeah. other one was... Uh, very stressful yeah <laughs> i'll try to do more in this vein because i definitely enjoyed making it 
Anyway, getting back to scary stories to tell in the dark, what do we think are some of our final points to touch on? Some of the final points of this film is that while we have been ragging on it, I do like a couple of the more finer details, e.g. Chuck calls his sister Ruth Ruthie, which yeah. shows that even though he acts like an asshole to everybody, he does still love his family, and it's very, very sweet. I really like that this movie is spooky without being mm. upsettingly terrifying. Like, we watched it late at night and yeah. didn't finish it until about 10pm, and I still managed to go to sleep and be completely fine, which is yeah. plus in my book. And Absolutely. This could be because we were taking notes, so we weren't as immersed in the film. I know I am a big scaredy cat, so when I'm not entirely immersed, it's harder for me to get spooked obviously but i still really really like that that it's more entry level spooks rather yeah. than full-on horror yeah very much i think my commendation for this film is that it for a film that is is what it is it serves really well as a nice introduction to horror and if you really liked it but didn't feel like it had enough of the visceral fear that it presents then definitely then you'll definitely move on to more terrifying bigger and work bigger badder, and things. badder things yeah that's a really good way of putting it if I was going to say bigger and better, but... <laughs> if you enjoyed it, but maybe feel like it was probably your limit, then that's great. Then you don't want to go any further. That's absolutely fine and a good way of gauging what you're interested in in terms of horror and Halloween-based films without going too far and maybe traumatizing yourself. So that's great. One thing I wanted to touch on, which is one of my favorite points in this film, is just that the cinematography is remarkably good in that it serves in such a way that it never allows us to feel disorientated and as a result we're kind of stuck in the film in a really good way for a horror film to stick to trap us in a film where we can understand everything that's going on we can see everything it's not it's never too dark it's never too disorienting or too confusing visually so we're always in the film and just a very readable yeah. followable film and if as a result you end up feeling like oh i knew i could see too much and tell too much about this film it wasn't really scary for me then that's ultimately fine but it definitely doesn't provide this avenue for miscommunication or misunderstanding which i find really really good because ultimately your imagination is one of the most powerful tools for creating fear and if your imagination is confused you're not going to be quite as afraid and this film doesn't suffer from that issue at all yeah, I think, I I think, think one yeah. final thing that I do want to touch on, because we didn't really Absolutely. talk about it much, is that this is a very narration or exposition heavy yeah. film, but yeah, it works absolutely. in a favour, like they do it on purpose, yeah. which is enjoyable. I like that idea of, we always say show don't tell, but you yeah. can obviously, once you understand the rules well enough, you can break them to a certain extent, and it really, really fits into this sort of like children's story vibes, big, the never-ending story vibes yeah. for me, where everything is being narrated, but it feels like that's just to help the young yeah, audience push that the it's story. directed at, like follow along with the story because obviously when you're a little bit younger i know in fact even before we started doing this podcast and i started actually looking for things you tend to miss some of the show don't tell elements of movies until yeah. you've watched them a couple times absolutely so I, I like that they've got that sort of readability element as well yeah i think personally the use of exposition and verbal exposition at that is not never used in a way that is oppressive in this film i know there is definitely points where it feels like a bit much and often there are points where characters are just explaining stuff about the history of cerebellos who also additionally i should talk about the final like twist at the end where she's seen as more of a victim is ultimately a nice sentiment but partially kind of ruins the the core of the film in that Sarah Bellows didn't kill the kids in the past with the poison but she did kill the kids in the modern day or the modern day of the film yeah I feel like they could have still done the whole I'll tell your truth I'll tell the proper truth shit yeah. without being like oh yeah she didn't of... murder everybody originally so all the murders she's committed since are fine like yeah. come on dude because, like, Stella kind of comes across as going out of her way to absolve Sarah. She, she comes across as a bellows apologist. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And it's really weird and it doesn't 
work for this film because ultimately her friends have just been killed by this woman and she's like, no, you're a victim and I will save you. And it's just like, this is such a weird turn for your character. She might have been a victim in life, but now she's a vengeful spirit and that shit doesn't fly. Yeah, absolutely. And as I get back to my point, the use of narration is never... Well, narration and verbal exposition is more useful because it reinforces and builds up to the final reveal and it provides a great deal of history and lore to the situation around Cerebellas that we actually can get a little bit more of a better understanding of what the hell is going on with her. And if we were to rely on visual exposition, I feel like a lot of that wouldn't come across. Yeah, it's almost the horror game effect. I don't know if anybody here has ever played a horror game where you've got to search for, like, notes, and all of the notes usually have the more lore-heavy elements, e.g. you'll be going through a medical place, and whenever you pick up something, it's like a medical file, and that tells you about either the next boss or what happened in this place and why it's so, like, spooky. And it it gives me that vibe, which I really enjoy. I think it makes it a little more interactive for people because they can be like, oh, okay, well, that's what's happening. Contrary to the narration, though, I do love that the book is never explained. The book itself is a mystical entity which is never... It's always show, don't tell. It's just you can see that the words are being written as they look at it. And it builds its own regular rules as well. Yeah, yeah, they never explain it other than just, oh, look at it, it's doing stuff. And if we try and rip out the pages or burn it, it doesn't do shit. And I love that. I love that they just went, hey, this book is an enigma. Yeah, but then it also still very clearly sets up it's in-world rules in that it's written in blood and as a result you can write your own story in it in blood and then also it can't be destroyed but pages can be ripped out because it's a book so ultimately you, you can never be stopped from ripping pages out of a book but even if you do that it still has a way of getting around it and it's not just oh i, I can't rip the pages out of the book i'm not strong enough just like how when you bur- try and burn the book the book just doesn't burn it has a tangibleness within the world where it doesn't just feel like a god's tool no yeah i really like the idea that the stories themselves are more magical than the book itself and the only reason that the book doesn't burn is because there's so many stories in that specific book which is really really well shown by the fact that when they rip pages out it just looks like the story was always being written on the page below whatever they've ripped out rather than they've ripped out the page the story is writing on i like that it isn't like oh they ripped out the page but then the words disappear and appear on the next page it's just like oh that was never the page we were writing on what are you talking about like yeah it's very fluid in the way that it works yeah absolutely but with that said do we want to get to our final thoughts and wrap up for this week's episode of our in-depth review Yeah, of course. So, final thoughts for me is, yes, the characters are assholes, but as I am usually a bleeding heart that gets way too attached to characters, it made it a lot more easy to just sit and watch the horror elements and appreciate them instead of getting too caught up in whether or not my favourite character was going to die. And I really like the little sort of background elements. Special mention to the guy on the radio who is constantly doing a voice even when two children have gone missing yeah, and even when Halloween has the kids have gone missing, yeah. He's, He's like, the kids are missing. Constantly <laughs> Hello, guys and girls. We got two missing kids. And yeah, he's just very consistent, even when it's not appropriate. It's very good. <laughs> Love that for him. Yeah. And for what me, about you? What are your final thoughts? Yeah, for me, I think we have been very critical of this film, but unlike the other films that we've been quite critical of, I don't think the criticism actually ruins the film or the enjoyment of the film in any real way. You become aware of it, but you don't have to take it so seriously that these criticisms actually destroy the foundation of the film. I think the film is still very much enjoyable. I I know that you and I both enjoyed it, and as a Halloween watch, it's very good, and I'll probably be watching it again quite soon. You never know. I really did like it, honestly, and I'll, I will definitely be reading the book. Fair enough. With that said, of course, you can find us on social media. Will is 
at Grey Mouse Inc. on Twitter and Will underscore Mortlock on Instagram and I am Nexatai on both Twitter and Instagram. Please do follow us because we regularly post little tidbits of podcasts or hint refresh updates which of course is just a way for us to hopefully interact with you we would love to hear from you i am more active on twitter and will is more active on instagram so that gives you a bit of choice of which platform you would like to use and if you've gotten to this point you get to be set up with our new hint for the week as we close out our halloween specials for this year our old hint was another halloween movie where our heroes are met with ghosts and ghouls and rely heavily on a book that should never be read late at night i wanted to make it blatant because ultimately we want to have a bit of fun here and if you guessed it good for you there's a trophy coming your way if you didn't that's just too bad ultimately you've got another chance this week at this new one, which is if you want to read it, Monique. Another story where a mystery unfolds around the death of a family member, seemingly at the hands of the family who had their beaks bloody at the feast. Hopefully that should immediately elicit some ideas and responses. Let us know Mm -hmm. if you guess it. If you you want a free trophy, then it's all yours if you can figure it out. But (laughs) with all that said, We'll see you next week. Make sure not to touch anything that doesn't belong to you, especially if it's in a haunted house, and stay safe out there. Thanks for listening.